He's a man of many talents, a muso, a once infamous mustachio wearing man, one of the few people to be in a submarine underneath the waves of Loch Ness, a dedicated lifetime of investigation. And he's here to talk to us today about a very unusual case. Sometimes the paranormal can be incredible. And that's because sometimes people are credulous. Even the best investigators can let their beliefs run away with them at times. So Malcolm Robinson is here to talk to us, I suppose, about a little moral fable about perhaps not taking all evidence on face value. He described it somewhat amusingly as a once impressive case, but it's still fascinating and most people are not familiar with all the details. So would you please welcome to the stage lecturer, author, Malcolm Robinson. He's such a lovely guy, isn't he? He's a lovely guy, in this. Right, well I've got, everybody who knows me uh, knows that I give a lot of talks about a whole range of different things. Ghost poker, guys, UFOs, you name it, I've done it. This is only the second time I've given this presentation. I come from a wee place called Hastings in East Sussex. And by Christ, it's good to be back in Scotland, I'll tell you that. Oh my God, and plus the drinks are a lot cheaper as well. Uh, so I'm actually here today to talk to you about garden sheds. Oh wait a minute, that's tomorrow's, that's tomorrow's. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I've got a lot to go through with you today, so let's get uh, the show on the road. It's, um, it's a combination of the Cottingley Fairies, Elementals. It's a subject I never really thought I would speak about, but again, it's all part and parcel of the paranormal world. This was a massive case. We'll come to that in due course. Right now, we're just going to go on a week in a roller coaster of uh, the paranormal world of nature spirits. Now, as we probably know, Fairies are generally described as human in appearance, they have magical powers, and they also that uh, wings, which were common in Victorian times, are very rare in folklore. Nowadays, fairies are often depicted with ordinary insect wings or butterfly wings, and some depictions of fairies uh, depict them wearing some sort of footwear, whereas other depictions are of uh, their, their bare foot. And another belief was that fairies were demons. They were hobgoblin, which was once a friendly household spirit. It became this wicked hobgoblin. And at one time, it was a common belief that fairy folklore evolved from folk memories. Memories of a prehistoric race into the fairy beliefs that we have today. So we obviously have got a, a lot of changes, a lot of theories, etc. And obviously the green clothing and underground homes were credited to their need to hide and camouflage themselves from allegedly hostile humans, would you believe? And a considerable amount of folklore about fairies revolves around changelings, uh, fairy children which have been left in the place of stolen human babies. It all sounds very bizarre. And also the fact is that sometimes fairies are described as assuming the guise of an animal. In Scotland here, fairy women assumed the shape of a deer, if you look back in folklore. And the most astonishing for me when I've read all these books and spoke to people, and you'll hear some of this later on, is people actually see, would you believe, fairy planes, fairy cars and boats, etc. How can that be? Yet people say that. Are they telling the truth? And what are they looking for? And some people have speculated that today's fairy sightings are perhaps alien creatures might in fact be some form of nature spirits. So we'll go back on that, we'll look at that as we go through today's presentation. Now we've all heard the terminology away with the fairies. Where does that come from? Well, it's, it's, it's in our psyche really. And this is a book by Kerry Greenwood, all about away with the fairies. And that's where more or less that comes from. But when we look, and one of the speakers spoke about it today, um, about uh, the, the moving, the disappearance of people. So here we have this kind of fairy dance, we've got the mushroom there, and we've got this mound. 
Now this mound allegedly took people into the fairy kingdom, and you certainly didn't want to go there, allegedly. And uh, here's, a, here's a rendition of this chap knowing full well that his friend is going to be taken away if he goes anywhere near this fairy ring. He's going to be abducted for one of a word, another words. And that's why we're going to come and look at some of the UFO abductions in regards to fairy lore. Are they a parable? Is it one and the same? Well, we'll have a look at that. As we know, a lot of people speculate that uh, these fairy uh, rings, which are purely just fungi, of course, and uh, allegedly fairies were seen in association with these fairy rings. I, I don't necessarily believe that that is the case, but uh, again, it's written into the folklore myths. Now, my lovely daughter, Karen, um, she stays in Soke, a lovely wee place near Alawa, and she went up to Dunvegan Castle. Hands up, anybody's been to Dunvegan Castle? Don't be shy. Okay, just a fair few, yeah, that's fine. Now, Dunvegan Castle, which is an absolutely lovely place, I need to get up there myself, to be honest with you, has uh, got itself fairy lore. It says a lot of stuff is going on with that. More so, this fairy flag and this fairy horn. And uh, we'll come to that, so I'm cased in this uh, display cabinet there. So there's theories. There's theories about what this, this fairy flag is. Is it originated from a gift from the fairies to an infant chieftain? Um, is it a gift to a chief from a departing fairy lover? Or is it a reward, this fairy flag? Is it a reward for defeating an evil spirit? Now, there are also various powers, allegedly, with this fairy flag. The ability to multiply a clan's military forces, the ability to save the lives of certain clan folk, the ability to cure a plague on cattle, uh, the ability to increase the chances of fertility, and the ability to bring herring into the loch at Dunvegan. And some traditions say that if the flag was to be unfurled um, and waved more than three times, it would either vanish or it would lose its powers forever. Now these are just all traditions and folklore. Are there any validity to these things? Now, my daughter took this photograph of the, uh, the grassy hills at the Fairy Glen in the Isle of Skye. Anybody hands up who's been to this area as well? Quite a few years, yeah, that's good. Because allegedly, and I'm saying allegedly a lot through this talk, uh, there have been a lot of reports of the wee folk, the wee elementals, these nature spirits, call them what you will. So, when we look at uh, the nature spirits, obviously they're also associated with a number of locations throughout the United Kingdom. Uh, we have all these kind of fairy glens that have been sighting there. We also have fairy bridges who have been seen in association with these bridges. And obviously we've got uh, the leprechauns of the And I think I've got the wrong talk on here because it shouldn't be that one here, but no matter. Um, yes. And uh, we also have the trolls of Norway. So I, I see what, you can see where I'm going with this that every country has got these traditions of fairies or trolls or etc. We also have the jinn, and the jinn are supposed supernatural creatures from early Arabian and later Islamic mythology. They are not purely spiritual, but apparently also physical in nature, and the jinn mentioned in Middle Eastern folk tales are often depicted as monstrous or magical creatures. And because we've only got a talk of about 50 minutes or so, we haven't got a great deal of time to really go into the whys and the wherefores of the jinn and various other supernatural creatures. Now, we've all, um, as children, we've always heard about the Grimm's fairy tales. Some of us have probably read these books. And again, this creates this, creates this interest in young children, all about uh, fairies and fairy lore, etc. Uh, this is a book by John Van Auken, uh, Angels, Fairies and Demons and Elementals, which was a very, very popular book back in the day, uh, read by many different people. And also we have the magic of fairies to children. We all know that young kids just love the, the thought of little fairies, of little creatures, etc. moving around. It's a big, big thing, but like any kids, they grow out of that, and uh, as, as we all do, allegedly. And uh, so much so that uh, obviously you've got young uh, girls dancing around the street in their, their fairy garb with their little wings and their little dresses on. So it's a big, it leaves a big impression on young children. 
But it's not just young children, we also have adults as well. <laughs> We've also got them here in these, uh, these fairy dresses, etc. And they actually have fairy parties for, for adults, etc., which is very bizarre. But are they real? Are they imaginary? What's going on? As we're adults now, but as young children, as I said, we've read all the books, the fairy tales, come on. There can't be any validity to this, surely. These are just stories, surely, yeah? What's the stories? What are they? Well, I think I've got a real talk on this one here because this is, a, this, is a, this is the latter part. I had another better version of this one, but uh, no matter, we got mixed up there. So, um, this one here allegedly is uh, a group of witches which were seen to be talking to little people in Cornwall. And uh, we have them here. Now, again, uh, this was taken off the internet. We have no, um, no proper information to really quantify the validity of this particular photograph, as is some of the other ones we have today. Uh, this one here uh, was taken in uh, Germany in the summer of 1927 and it's not a great rendition because it's quite pixelated etc and, and that could be anything because a lot of UFOs, a lot of ghosts, it's not that at all, it's all simulacrum or pareidolia. You look into the sky and say, oh that looks like a horse's head or it looks, of course it is. The human brain is hardwired to look at shapes and make sense out of nonsense. So we have to be very careful while looking at these photographs. Now, one of the most bizarre <laughs> cases that uh, I came across while researching uh, this particular talk was the Wellington Park driving gnomes. Has anybody heard about this? Put your hands up, don't be shy. Okay, it's only a few of you. Okay, this, this is very bizarre, very strange. Now, Wellington Park, and we'll come to this story in a moment, as you can see from this slide, uh, was built by Sir Francis Willoughby uh, between 1580 and 1588 for his family. And it's now a prominent Grade 1 listed building. Lovely place. Beautiful grounds, as you can see here. And it stands on a natural hill, which is three miles west of Nottingham city centre. It's set in 500 acres of spectacular gardens and parkland. And it was actually used, the hall was actually used for the Wayne Manor, well, used as Wayne Manor in the 2012 Batman film, uh, Dark Knight Rises. And uh, you can see why it's absolutely majestic. You've got the, the deer here in the foreground. Now this is just a, a kind of Google map, if you like, of the location, which is quite pertinent to, to talking about this crazy, bizarre case. Um, but if you look at this uh, slide here, you've got the University of Nottingham, uh, to the right hand side here. So it is fairly, even though the parks and all these grounds, it's still fairly built up nearby. It's built up, which is prevalent at the moment. Now, as you can see from this slide, this is the area where these strange, bizarre events unfolded. And they are bizarre. This is why I love this subject so much, you know, it's so stupid sometimes. So, what happened? What happened? <laughs> Well, the story goes that on September 1979 at 8.30, seven children between 8 and 10, so 60 little men, the size of them, in 30 small cars. The little men chased the children, but they didn't catch them. They were also seen in the trees. Again, we have another depiction of this, where this area was. This is at north end of, uh, of the, the lake where all this activity unfurled. Now they were even, would you believe, they were even seen coming out of the splits in the trees. And these are actual photographs of that area. This is not just a tree just put up here. This is from Wellington Park. Now, yes, of course kids can lie. Adults can lie. Police officers can lie. Everybody can lie. But for us researchers, we have to interview people and listen to what they say. <clears throat> it's all childish imagination. Young kids, we know. Young kids can see spirit. And as they grow older, they lose that ability to perceive psychic events, etc. So let's not put, throw the baby out with the bathwater because, the, I mean, there may be some semblance of this. Now, I know I said this, the, the story is crazy. They were even seen these, these little dwarfs, call them what you want, well, elves, in these little cars, jumping over these logs. It's stupid. 
But this is why the whole bizarre world of UFOs and the paranormal is stupid. Uh, because it doesn't make any sense. This is why, as researchers, we're trying to get a lid on what's happening here in this world. Now, this is a headmaster, so the story goes that they saw these little guys in the cars and, and uh, the following day they spoke about it at school and the headmaster interviewed them, as, as you can see with this microphone and the, the cassette. And this is what he said. He said, I think the tape reveals the wide measure of corroboration between the children, as well as the fluency with which they were able to describe the events. I remain sceptical as to the explanation of what they saw, but I'm also convinced that the children were describing a real occurrence. And this is one of the newspaper cuttings that was, uh, that was taken at that particular time. It didn't go just across England, it went right across Europe, this case. It was so bizarre. Now, Janet Bord has written a wonderful book on fairies. Uh, you should really uh, get, if you can, get a hold of it. And she says, this is what she said, Janet Bord, a researcher of fairy lore. Over six years before the Willington fairies were reported in the media, I had corresponded with Marina Fry of Cornwall, who wrote to me giving details of her own fairy sighting when she was nearly four years old. Around about 1940. One night, she and her older sisters, all sleeping in one bedroom, awoke to hear a buzzing sound. One sister said, music and, and bells. Looking out the window, they saw a little man in a tiny red car driving around in circles. He was about 18 inches tall and had a white beard and a droopy pointed hat. He just disappeared after a while. So that was several years before the Willington Park events transpired. Now, um, I do a lot of research, uh, as I say, I've been, uh, in a set, I've been down in a Loch Ness submarine to a depth of over 600 feet. Um, SPI took an expedition up to Loch Mora, and uh, for anybody who doesn't know, allegedly it's got its own creature, its own version of Nessie called Morag. It's 11 miles long, Loch Mora. It's, uh, I think it's the third deepest loch in Europe. And we went up in 1990 just to do a wee recce of the place and have a wee look around it and see perhaps if you could spot any famous humps or a big neck coming out of the river. But we're unsuccessful, but the story I'm about to tell you is really, it's in relation to fairy lore as well. So this is uh, Ron Halliday. Uh, Ron was there with uh, Ian Shanes, who unfortunately can't be with us today. He's got a prior engagement. We were great to see him. Um, so there's Ron uh, talking to uh, Ian Shanes, and, and that's Loch Moore there, and they were on this pathway, so... I was, I was, uh, then Ron finished his conversation, and I was walking with Ian up this path, talking away as you do, and he knew suddenly he wasn't there! Where did he go? And he was back about 20 yards back down the track, talking to a bush. What are you doing, Ian? What are you doing? And he says, oh, Malcolm, don't you see them? This is just a recreation, of course. Don't you see them? Uh, no, what am I looking at? He says, these, these little fairies are in this bush. And I'll tell you what, if he said he saw that, because I've worked with him for many years when I lived in Scotland, he was, he's a brilliant psychic. And if you can take what he said to the bank, and I say, well, what's happening? What are they, what are they talking about? Oh, they're, they're just interested why we're here. They just want to know why we're here. And uh, I says, that's fine. He says, they're very curious. And uh, I went, great, fantastic, lovely. Now, um, this is a, a slide from uh, a wee place called Socky, which is near um, Alawa. Now, this is back in the 1960s, after the war, they put up the, the prefabs. Uh, some of the young kids in the audience may not remember them, but us guys, as old as me, I'm sure they do. Uh, temporary housing accommodation. So what, what has this got to do with fairies? Well, I'll tell you. It's all changed that now, by the way. It's all proper houses, it's, in, it's up there. So I was having a sleepover, maybe I was about five, six year, years of age, and I was sleeping over in one of these prefabs at Socky. And I was so excited, oh, you're in somebody else's house, you know, this is great. And I remember I was so excited, me and my cousins, we, we didn't go to sleep. So we looked out the window, this is a recreation that's very, very similar to the prefab in Socky. We looked out the, the window, and I'll tell you what, I am convinced to this day that as we looked over, we saw a warm glow, a warm glow just in the grass. And I could see for a minute or seconds a small little figure moving around in this warm glow. Now again, is that childish imagination? 
wishful thinking, or what? Or was it real? Don't forget that the reason each and every one of you are here today is because you love this subject. And, uh, and it takes its form, many, many forms. And by the way, many skeptics in the, in the house. That's all right. That's okay. <laughs> you won't be when you leave. So, um, now people have been seeing strange, bizarre creatures throughout time. We know that. I mentioned about the trolls, the leprechaun, the djinn, etc. So it's all been there throughout prehistory. So the question then arises, are today's alien creatures yesterday's elementals and fairies? Think about it. And I've got some little illustrations here. A big, big a case in America was this one, the Kelly Hopkinsville case, uh, which uh, well, was talking about it just now. It was a claimed close encounter in 1955 near Kelly Hopkinsville in Christian County, Kentucky. And ufologists regard it as one of the most significant and well documented cases in the history of alien creature encounters. So the story goes that on August 21st, 1955, five adults and seven children arrived at the Hopkinsville police station claiming that small alien creatures were attacking their farmhouse. Can you believe that? I'm going to the police. And they had been holding them off for at least four hours with gunfire. Now, two of the adults, Elmer Sutton and Billy Ray Taylor, claimed that they had been shooting at between 12 and 15 short, dark figures who repeatedly popped up at the doorway and also the windows. And this is just a kind of rendition of uh, a design, if you like, graphic uh, rendition of what these wee creatures were. Now, what's going on here? Eh? What's going on here? Is this, is this true? Uh, this is another little creature here. And that's the thing about ufology. Um, I'm probably better known from the talks in the UFOs. There's so many strange wee creatures. Probably the most significant and common one is these uh, small grey guys, about three and a half to four feet tall, black and almond shaped eyes, child like body, grey, translucent skin, but not like this. This guy looks more like one of the goblins from yesteryear, which I spoke about earlier. Uh, these are other illustrations of these creatures here. Slightly different with this guy, but in the main, they've got the long arms down to more or less their toes. They've got this triangular shaped face, and they've got these bizarre um, uh, ears, if, if that's what they, indeed they were. And of course, the story not, didn't just go national, it went right across the globe, this story. Can it be true? A photograph there. Now, another case is uh, this one. Now, this is what I'm saying at this part of the talk. We're trying to draw the parallels. Uh, today's alien sightings and little creatures did yesterday, like I said, the you know, leprechauns. Here's one in Chile. Is this true or is it false? The facts are, on May 10th, 2004, the witness took some photographs at Park Forestal, which he downloaded to his computer the following day. Now, he took a photograph of a group of uh, state police on horseback. They were patrolling the sector, and it was taken at 5.40 from the corner of J.M. De La Barra and Avenue Cardigel, Jose Maria Caro, in front of Bella Bellas Artes, looking east. I'm glad I finished that sentence. And uh, <laughs> so this is uh, the area in question. Now, admittedly, I don't know which lane they were in. You'll see the photograph in a moment. But it was definitely, the, the photograph you're about to see was in one of these lanes. I'm not quite sure which one. So here we go. What's going on here? We'll get an enlargement in a moment. Have a wee look at that. So the, the photograph is slightly out of focus. Um, you've got the state police, one going one way, one going another way, and you've got what appears, it's a big appears in inverted commas, what appears to be possibly one of these small grey creatures. And if we look in, you can see clearly what appears to be the head, the body, the, the arm coming out, the legs are in motion, the bend of the knees. Is it truly um, a little creature? Or is it, who said yes? Thank you very much. <laughs> Or, and I'm sorry about this, but I'm still a skeptic, even though I believe in life after death and, and aliens, etc. I'm still bloody skeptical. Now, so what I'm saying with that is that maybe is that simulacrum? Is it pareidolia? Is it all the leaves on this on this track which shaped in to look like a little grey? Or is it a little grey? Am I throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Look at it again. Certainly, you've got a distinction of a head, a body, an arm, legs, etc. Looks very bizarre. 
Now this one here, it was taken in a back garden in Preston, and uh, basically what's happening with this photograph, we've all had our gardens redesigned, so you take a wee photograph of before and after, don't you, if you're doing a big landscape in your garden. And this is the story behind this one here. And it was, uh, it was also um, enhanced, etc., by Jason Graves. Where are you, Jason? Put your hand up. There you are. Thanks for coming up from England, mate. Very good. Well done, sir. <laughs> now, admittedly, it's a wee bit pixelated. Um, the photograph you're seeing is very similar. It's very similar to the one in Chile. You've got this head, the body, the, the movement of the arms, the legs, of course, going in a different way. Now, Jason, you did enhance that, didn't you? Yes? Thank you. Um, so we have various renditions, colour enhancement, colour contouring, etc. And whilst you do that, you can clearly see what appears to be a little figure. And that's the thing. People can see things and go, oh my God, that's a bloody ghost there. And then you've got three other people standing next to you. I don't see anything. Well, what are you looking at? And I think the more psychic somebody is, the more chance we will see of something bizarre. Yes, we hand up. Two of them? Possibly, yeah, yeah. So I think the more psychic aware you are, I mean, I've been, I've been slapped by a ghost, I've had my hair pulled, I've been kicked. Christ, they don't like me, do they? <laughs> and I was a skeptic at that time. I said, I'm going out to just prove these stupid things called ghosts in the earth. What a load of rubbish. God, how wrong was I? When I've spent many nights in haunted houses, and as I say, I've had my hair pulled. That's, that's when I came off that sceptical fence. I wasn't on drugs, I wasn't hallucinating. Oh, the fright. I could I'd be here all day telling the stories I've had. Um, so that's another kind of colour contour um, to kind of tidy it up. And uh, just to show you in greater detail of this figure. Very similar, as I said a moment ago, to the Chile figure. Uh, and if we put them all together, We've got them like that. So that was the original photograph there. And we've got, why is he there? In fact, what's going on here? What is going on? If this is a bona fide little creature, what on earth is he doing in a back garden in Preston? I don't know. I really don't. That's what makes it all so incredible. Now, that brings us on to the Cottingley Fairies. And like I say, I had two versions of this talk. Uh, the other version is much better than this, but we'll do this one. That's my fault for no checking. So, <laughs> oh, terrible. Now, that's maybe a daft question. Who today has never heard, never heard of the Cottonwood Fairies? Put your hands up if you've not heard of it. Two or three days. Okay, so most of you have, right? That's fine. So, we have the Cottonwood timeline. So, we're going to go through how this story evolved right through the stages. And uh, we'll take you through it like that. First and foremost, um, Cottingley um, is obviously near Leeds in Bradford, and more or less it's kind of centre-ish of England. Always, when I give a talk, I always like putting maps up in case people say, where's that about, where's Cottingley about? So it's always nice to just show people where it is. Now, this is um, Main Street in Cottingley, and that the houses still stand today. They're still there. They haven't been demolished or anything. The place is heavily overgrown now with uh, new houses. All the fields, all the, the trees, the forest, away it goes, and it's a lot of houses. Uh, it's, it's a great shame, actually. This is an original sketch from 1917, and um, what it uh, looked like at the time, and that's the end house where uh, the two girls um, were, and that's Cottingley Beck there, and the, the forest there. So let's have a wee look at the street that the, the girls lived in, just to give you an idea of what houses were like back in the day. So. As we know, these, these were the type of streets you would get in anywhere, Glasgow, Edinburgh, uh, Hastings, Alabama, whatever, it was all these kind of back in the day that is. And um, this is uh, Elsie and her mother at 31 Main Street. So it's just nice just to show you what was, what was going on at that time. Uh, this is Elsie, she was 12, a pretty girl, 12 years of age with her mother Polly and her father Arthur. And both mother and father were soon to be catapulted into this bizarre tale of fairies and all the rest of it. This is her uh, aged 15, a uh, striking looking young girl. And this photograph here was taken uh, in 1917. It was taken to send over to her father, um, Francis's father, who was serving obviously over in France, um, Britain at that time and the rest of Europe of course. 
were fighting in the Great War. So he was over there. And this is Elster Wright, taken in 1920. And we've got the two girls here in 1921 at the Beck, where all this you're about to hear transpired. Um, also underneath this ferry bridge which spanned uh, this beck. And the beck, of course, is just another word for a stream. It's, uh, it's not that big. And uh, let's have a look. This is them as teenagers in one of the gardens there. So how did it all start? How did this scenario, how did this all happen? Well, first and foremost, you've got to understand that both girls claimed to have seen fairies way back in the day, even before they took the photographs. They claimed that they'd seen these little people in the mossy banks, etc. And they were always apt to tell their parents. Now, Frances, the cousin, had come over from South Africa in 1917. And with her, she brought a very, very important book, which will be big in the story of the Cottingley case in a moment, and you'll see. Now, like I say, they were always down at the beck, they were falling in, they were coming by, they were wringing wet, and they were getting told off by their mum and dad, you've got to stop going down there. No, no, we can't. All the fairies are down there. You can't stop us. Now, Elsie's father had just bought a new box brownie camera uh, back in the day, and he was very precious of this camera. He didn't want anybody to get it, but the little girls said, oh, God, Dad, you've got to give us this camera. We could prove it. The fairies are real. Don't be so bloody stupid. There are no such things as fairies. No, come on, Dad, give us a camera. Let, let us have it. And eventually they wore them down, you know, because, uh, yeah, after much persuasion, they reluctantly, okay, just to shut you up, here's the camera. This is uh, the mid's quarter plate camera. This took the first of five photographs. This took the first two fairy photographs. You'll see another camera as we go through the top, what was given to them as well. So how did it start? Well, they were, they'd finally got the camera. They were gone for less than an hour and they came back very excited. Oh, they were so excited. We've got it, we've got it, we've got the fairies. And the father's just shaking his head. I don't believe you've got anything. So he had a dark room, etc. Uh, back in the day. So he went into his dark room, he developed the photographs. And, oh, Christ, man, you've got something there right enough. What's this? And this is the first two of the five famous photographs. The vast majority in the audience today have all seen them. Um, here we go. This is the iconic Cottingley Fairy photograph from 1917. And you'll see a big, big change in a moment because look at it, it's very sharp, very prominent. It's very sharp and prominent. It's there, it's clear, it's crystal. Uh, the, the little stream in the background, the way it kind of falls, if you like, uh, and slightly out of focus. Now this was the first generation print. Look at it, study it, have a look at it. Very different, very different from the original Cottingley Fairy photographs because there's hardly anything there. The, where's all the, the clarity? Where's all the, you can't see anything in the old dresses, etc. Admittedly, yes, it's very creased and maybe it's been given around for a long time. This is it in black and white, still no great detail. Still nothing sharp and in focus, etc. So if we look at the original, which is that one, and uh, sorry, the, the original that one, a bigger part, and the retouch there, it's, uh, there's a marked difference. There's a marked difference in clarity for sure. How did that happen? How did that go from there to there? Well, how about we look just now? This was a second photograph. This is uh, Elsie Wright. This was photograph was taken by Francis. And it shows a little goblin, a little elf or goblin with the pointy uh, feet, the arms and some wings, like a wee pointy hat. And she's extending her hand out to this, this little, little thing. That was another iconic photograph. This is it just enhanced a little bit. You can see the contours of the head, the eyes, the nose. It's very sharp, it's very defined, it's very in your face. And um, they claimed that this was the real deal. So what happened next? Like I said, the father thought it was just one big prank. Come on, there's no validity to this. And know these two photographs lay in a cupboard for fully two years before things changed again. So what happened then was that to uh, enter the Theosophical Society, and there's a number of branches throughout Scotland and England. Uh, this one was based in Bradford, West Yorkshire. They came into the story. They came on board. Uh, they became public in 1919. 
So Elsie's mother attended a meeting of the Theosophical Society in Bradford, and the lecture that evening was by a chap giving a lecture on fairy life. And at that particular uh, meeting, um, Polly showed the two fairy photographs to the guest speaker, who have a look at this thing. What do you think about this? Now, as a result, those two photographs was then displayed at the Society's annual conference in Harrogate. And there, they became so they came to the attention of a leading light of that society, a guy called Edward Gartner, who plays a big, big role in this Cotting the Fairy scenario. This is Edward here. He was the General Secretary of the Theosophical Society, big, big player. He was like the bee's knees, if, if you like, of that, uh, of that time. And uh, this is his colleague, Geoffrey Hodgson, and this was taken by Elsie. So this fellow here, He's looking for the fairies himself, and it, unbeknown to him, um, Elsie had taken this photograph and without his permission or his awareness, I should say. Um, now, a year later, another player becomes involved in this fantastic, crazy story, and it was a pioneer of spiritualism and the author of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. He learned about these photographs from Edward Gardner now. France, sorry, um, Arthur Conan Doyle, as I said, was a big, big spiritualist. He firmly, like I do, believed in life after death. And I, the only reason I believe in it is an absolute fantastic wealth of evidence. And God, we could go into that for a, a time, I'll tell you. So, communication went on between Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and uh, Edward Gardner. Now, Arthur Conan Doyle was on a tour of Australia at that time, so there were no emails and no this going back, it's telegrams, so things were slow. But he did say, keep me in touch with what's going on in Cottingley. And eventually, um, Arthur Conan Doyle decided to publish the first two photographs in the Strand magazine of 1920, of which you can see here on this slide here. And part two was um, published the following year, in March 1921, with new fairy photographs. And we'll come to that in a moment. Strand Magazine. And this is part two again. The evidence for fairies. Arthur Conan Doyle with more fairy photographs. Now these photographs are shown to this guy. This guy here, so Oliver Lodge, who believed the photographs to be fake. He just, well, no chance. This, these are not the real deal. And he reckoned that it was a troop of dancers masquerading as uh, fairies and ex expressed doubt as to their distinctly Parisian hairstyles. So he was kind of on to something here. Now, at this point, we have a second camera involved. This camera would go on to uh, photograph the, the remaining three fairy photographs, which you'll see in a moment, slightly different. Uh, it was given to them by Edward Gardner in July 1920. So these are the following three photographs uh, you've all probably seen them on the television, on, on books and documentaries, etc. And we have Elsie Wright in August uh, 1920, slightly head back, looking at this little angelic little fairy, hosing it, it, putting out a posy of flowers, just extending her hand. Looks very surreal, doesn't it? That's one of them. This one here is called Francis and the Leaping Fairy, a cane taken the same day. Her head's coming back as allegedly this, this little fairy jumped off one of the branches or leaves uh, in this down by the beck, down by the stream near their family home. You can see you've got the arms going up, the legs, etc. This was the fifth and last photograph, and it doesn't look fantastic because you can hardly see anything. You've got Images going on here. Oh, yeah, I'm at the end. Okay. So, Gardner sent the prints along with the original glass plate negatives to a guy called Harold Snelling. He was a, a photography expert. Now, he believed that the negatives were entirely genuine with no trace, no trace of studio work whatsoever, which might involve card or paper models. That was Snelling's opinion. But he didn't go so far as to say that they were the real deal. He didn't go so far to put his hand on heart and say they're real photographs of fairies. So, next on the scene was Kodak, a big, big multinational company. Not so much then, but it was. They sought the, um, uh, the opinion from Kodak. Several of the company's technicians examined the prints and they, showed, they said they showed no signs of being faked, but they concluded 
that that's not conclusive evidence that they were authentic photographs of fairies. And Kodak decided to decline this and issue a certificate of authenticity. So they went elsewhere. They went down the road. <laughs> they went to Elmford. And uh, they were uh, examined by the staff and people who know what they're talking about at Elford. And they said, unequivocally, there was some evidence of faking with these photographs. And again, we've got these photographs side by side. We've got Elsie and Francis, iconic photographs of the time. These are some coloured versions of the photographs. Um, obviously, these have just been people who have said, well, what kind of colours were they like? Tell me, talk to me, describe the colours. So they decided to put the colours in on these uh, plates. Here's another one. He's got, she did say he's got a red hat, he's got a red body, a red jacket with black tights. So they've done the colour for that one as well. Now this is the fifth and final photograph in colour. And as you can see here, you can see a wee bit more clearly, you've got a face, you've got the, the, the hair, you've got the long flowing hair, the hair there, the yellow dress, the extended arm, the face, the wings, etc, etc, and going on. So there's something clearly going on there at the back. But of course, were the photographs real? No, of course, they weren't. They were hoaxed, and uh, we'll come to that. So let's have a wee look at the timeline of how this hoax developed and how, what happened. 1971, BBC Television's nationwide programme investigated the case, but Elsie stuck to her story and she says, I've told you, they're photographs of figments of her imagination. And that's what I'm sticking to. And that's what she said on nationwide programme. Uh, I'm old enough to remember that, I'm sure one or two of these are as well. Don't put your hands up for that one. Uh, in 1978, well, in comes Skeptic Boo Hoo, um, the bane of ufologist's life, uh, a guy called James Randi, who said, oh, wait a minute, these photographs look very, very similar to those that was found in Princess Mary's gift book, which was published in 1915. And if you look, the original photograph, Princess Mary's gift book, original photograph, Princess Mary's gift book, very, very similar. I'm sure you're all sitting there saying, yeah, yeah, market, they do indeed look the very same. And that's the thing. They were, um, now let me go to the story. Let me go to that. 1982, the girls finally come clean. They admitted to a guy called Joe Cooper, a researcher, in an article in the Unexplained magazine that the photographs had indeed been faked. Um, but she still maintained that the photographs, sorry, the fairies that they saw were the real deal. But she admitted that they had copied illustrations, correct, from the popular children's book at the time, Princess Mary's Gift Book, the one in green that you just saw a moment ago. Uh, they said that they had cut them out, put them on kind of cardboard and supported them with hat pins, uh, disposing of their props in the back. And, um, but the cousins always disagreed about the fifth and final photograph. This is uh, Cottingley, The Last Truth in the Unexplained magazine. And uh, that's the story they got. So like I say, the, Elsie maintained that the photographs were faked, but Francis insisted they were genuine. And in the Unexplained article, she further stated, it was a wet Saturday afternoon, and we were just mooching about with our cameras and Elsie had nothing prepared and I saw these fairies building up in the grasses and I just aimed the camera and took a photograph. This is in relation to the fifth photograph. So again we have uh, the depictions of the Cottingley fairies and the illustrations from the Princess Mary gift book. Uh, all very clear cut for sure. Another one here. And the illustrator for that was a guy called Claude Arthur Shepherdson. He did the, the lovely line drawings there, as you can see. And if we look at them side by side, clearly you can see the poise, the stature, the guile, if you like, of the legs, of the motion of the body. And uh, there's some, a lot going on with that photograph. So like I say, they still believed that the fifth and final photograph was real and uh, not figments of their imagination. Allegedly. So did this ruin? Did this ruin Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's career? This is him here, look, this is a pit, the newspaper with the Dunsey's hat, the, the little fairies. He did take a lot of stick, the poor man, you know. And um, that's, that's his son there, by the way, um, Arthur Conan Doyle's son. 
And of course, she wrote the famous book uh, about Sherlock Holmes. Now, there were actually a seance, would you believe, for, uh, for Sir Arthur at the Albert Hall, and a row of chairs were arranged on the stage, and one chair was left empty for Sir Arthur in the hopes that he may turn up. Uh, of course, he didn't turn up, <laughs> uh, but there were many people in the audience that claimed that they felt his presence with, with them. But that's just, you know, people just feel these things. It doesn't mean anything, truly. Or, or does it? 1985. An interview on Yorkshire Television's Arthur C. Clarke's World of Strange Powers. Elsie said that she and Francis were too embarrassed. Too embarrassed to admit the truth after phoning an eminent man like Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, who was the author of Sherlock Holmes. She says, Two village kids and a brilliant man like Conan Doyle. Well, we could only keep quiet. You know, it must have been embarrassing. And in the same interview, she said, I never even thought of it as being a fraud. It was just Elsie and I having a bit of fun, and I can't understand to this day why they were taken in. Maybe they wanted to be taken in. Now, it should be known about um, Elsie, this. Um, she was an extremely gifted and accomplished artist. She painted landscapes and portraits, mainly in watercolour. Thank you. Uh, she had attended Bradford Art College since the age of 13 and also found work in a photographic lab and a greeting card factory during the war. And in the dark room, her job was to create composite photographs of fallen soldiers with pictures of loved ones. And during this time, she had the opportunity to work with glass plate cameras. This is Elsie John Ferry in 1983, many years later. This is more uh, drawings by Elsie Wright. So she was an accomplished artist, clearly quite capable of uh, doing this hoax. <coughs> Another one here, these little figures, and this one here, and this is Francis's daughter, Christine Lynch, with a photograph of the famous Cotting the Fairies. So, um, Arthur Conan Doyle later believed that the fairies could be thought forms. In other words, the desire to see these fairies somehow allowed the girls to see them. And when we remember, we have a guy called Theodore Ted Judserius. Now he was known for what's known as photo photographs. Got that right? <laughs> and he claimed he went up to a camera with just normal film in it, no, no exposed, just brand new film, and he made things happen, but allegedly with the power of his mind. This is him here screaming the desire into the camera to try and get some images, thought or graphs. And here's one he got of this top of this building. This one here, it looks like, uh, you know, in Greece, these the, the big uh, buildings in Greece. Now, it's true, there were no, um, these, these, uh, the film was not, it was brand new film, it hadn't been exposed, it was brand new. We've got a face here going on. We have three what appears to be soldiers, maybe, in peaked caps. This one here of cars, so he clearly done something. But we've got to ask ourselves, okay, why? Why would the girls need to make up a story such as this? And I'm going to quickly rush through this last two or three minutes, in this, because I know you're raving at me now. Well, as we know, 1914-1918 was World War I. We had no Nintendos, no iPhones to help the young kids of the day. They had to make their enjoyment off their own back. The go-karts, etc. Uh, they played in the carpets with the toy soldiers, so they had to amuse themselves. This is them. Sometimes they went on holidays, they enjoyed the, the seaside, etc. But that's where the idea was born. Francis brought this book over uh, from South Africa and the idea was born. But did the girls have an inspiration to do this, folks? Did they have an inspiration? Well, um, we heard the lovely Alison Dunlop talk about marrying uh, apparitions earlier today. Well, Fatima, how can this possibly come into the story? I'm going to finish on this one. 1917, these young kids claimed to have seen the Virgin Mary, as you heard earlier today from, from Alison, and 70,000 people were gathered on this hillside because they claimed that the Virgin Mary was going to appear. Could it be real? If 
for Germany, can you really appear? These are original photographs taken at Fatima in 1917 with 70,000 people. It had been absolutely pouring a rain. They were soaked, they were drenched, the ground was all soggy. And let's have another look, quick look at the photograph. That's it. People just praying. And then suddenly something happened, as Alison said earlier. The heavens opened. This is some more photographs, they're all staring into the sky. This is, uh, uh, this is not a real photograph, the crowds are, but this is just a rendition. Suddenly there was this ball of light majestically appeared in the sky. And within about five or six minutes, their clothes, everybody's clothes, were bone dry. Even the, even the ground was bone dry. This is it here. Can you imagine that? It's incredible. We'll go into that one. So Francis died in 1986 and Elsie in 1988. Um, these are just other photographs showing you how easy it is to recreate the Cottingley fairies. Uh, today's example, present day examples, anybody can do it with the technology we have today. And I'll just quickly go through that. I've got one here on that. Recreating the original Cottingley fairies. So it is easy to do. We won't go into that. So at the end of the day, um, using a bully, Buchanan line there, at the end of the day, what do I think about, and he's wonderful, he was great today, what do I think about fairies and elementals and nature spirits? It's very difficult to put your lovely minds in 50 minutes or more of how big this subject can be, because I do believe that people genuinely see nature spirits. They've always been with us as part of our psyche, they're part of our, our world, if you like, but only certain people can see them. Well, it's the same with ghosts. As I said before, you have five people in a room, three people see the ghost, the other two, well, ah, I can't see it. So I think the more psychically aware you are, then you'll see something very bizarre. Now, I could go on and on, as, as, as anybody knows, I, I love to talk. I, I, don't, I don't shut up when I'm up here. So I will have to shut up because I'm aware that obviously we've got other wonderful speakers here today. All I'll say in closing, ladies and gentlemen, is keep an open mind. Look at all the, look at the good stuff, look at the bad stuff. There's a lot of wool over, it's got to be pulled over your eyes. But I'll tell you something, it's real. UFOs are real, ghosts are real, poltergeists are real. It's a real phenomenon going on. I'm going to further my book on the socket poltergeist next year. But I'd just like to thank each and every single one of you. Some have travelled up from England and the borders, etc. for coming here today. So many thanks. Enjoy the rest of the conference, and if anybody wants a wee chat, out in the bar, buy me a pint, I will happily talk to you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Martin Robinson.